Oh, my beautiful wife and I have been married now 26 years, just celebrated 26 years in May. Uh, so she looks like she's 26 years old. I don't know if you ever see her, you're like, oh my gosh, why is that old guy uh, with, that, with that beautiful young woman right there? Matter of fact, one day, this is a true story, I'm not making it up sometimes when you're preaching, you could lie a little bit, you know, to kind of make it, make it a little better story. This is a God to honest story, okay? I am in the house with my wife. We have a plumber at the house. The plumber said, this is what the man says to my wife out loud. Can you go get your dad and tell him I want to talk to him what's going on with the plumbing. Onika walks into the room with a big smile on her face and shares with me these terrible words that that plumber said. I feel, I don't look that old, I feel like. She just looks that young. But we're excited about today. We're gonna open up the Bibles together, our Bibles together. If you have them, why don't you open up to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Oh, I love the book of Acts, the birth of the church. Acts chapter 16. And we're gonna read a bunch of verses today. You guys okay with that? You okay? We're gonna dig into the Bible. We're going to grow together. For those of you who like to take notes, I love this about Passion City. Y'all are note takers, okay, at our church. I'm like, come on, y'all, take notes. God, I think God wants to speak to you. Uh, if you like to take notes, I have a title for today, and it's this, How It Started, How It's Going. How It Started, How It's Going. We're going to begin reading in Acts chapter, oh, let's go verse number six. Paul and his companions traveled throughout the region of Phygia and Galatia. Phygia, that word was kind of messing me up a little bit. I wasn't sure exactly how to say it. Kind of like Trillith. Is it? Trillith. In Galatia, having been kept, watch this, kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. This is not Asia like we know. This would be Asia uh, like uh, Turkey, Asia, modern-day Turkey. And when they, when they came to the border of Messiah, they tried to enter Trillith, Bithynia, but, but the Spirit of Jesus, watch this, would not allow them to. Huh. So they passed by Messiah and went down to Troas during the night. Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. And after Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. We're going to look at a bunch of verses here. Let's just pause on these first ones. I love the Bible so much, and I love that y'all are a Bible-loving church as well. We believe that God, these aren't just like dead words on a page, right? This is God speaking to us. As I heard one writer say it, we don't just read the Bible, we listen to it, because it's, it's God speaking to us. So as we open up the scriptures here, let's just trust the Holy Spirit. He's going to open up our hearts and draw all of us closer. Closer, uh, to him. So we're reading here that Paul and his companions are in a particular part of the world and they want to go to another part of the world and all they want to do is preach the gospel. All they want to do is help people. And it's said two times that the Holy Spirit said, nope, can't go there. Then the Spirit of Jesus says, nope, can't go there. Well, all, all I want to do is preach. All I want to do is something good. All I want to do is something positive. All I want to do is help. Have you ever been in a little quandary like this? You're like, man, all I want to do is help people, but I can't seem to get this business off of the ground. All I want to do is finish school so that I can go ahead and fulfill the plan and purpose that God has on me, but I keep hitting my head up against the same brick wall. Sometimes we have a dream in our heart, a desire in our heart, and we want to maybe tell the devil, get out of my life, devil, and God's like, it's not the devil. It's the spirit of Jesus trying to stop you from going a direction you don't want to go here because sometimes we think if if there's a barrier, if there's a wall, then it must be bad. It must mean that God's not in. It must mean somehow we got to get through that thing. And yes, that's true. I want us to have the fight and the fire and I want us to have the grit to be able to push through things. No doubt about it. But there are some times I want us to pause just a little bit and say spirit of 
of Jesus, would you lead me and guide me? I don't want my will. I want your will. I don't want my way. I want your way. I don't know where this prayer got lost in the church, but somewhere along the line, we started asking for our will and not God's will. But we're going to be a church passion city that says, God, I don't want my way. I want your way. So shut whatever door you need to shut and go ahead and close whatever opportunity you need to close because I just want to go where you want me to go. Not just where I want to go. I read a long time ago, and, and Lou, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I read this for the first time in I Am Not, But I Know I Am, where you wrote about how in Genesis it was evening and then there was morning the first day. Am I making that up? I don't think I am. That's good. He's humble. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening and there was a morning the third day. When you read through the book of Genesis, you see that the day starts at night. When you go to sleep, that's when the day starts. That means as you are resting, God's working. And when you wake up, you are waking up to an activity that has already been happening all throughout the day. So now when I wake up, I'm saying, God, the day has not started. The day's already going. I want to partner with what you're already doing in this day. And I want to fulfill the plan and purpose that you have for me. Friends, stop stressing out so much. You weren't in control in the first place. It was never about you in the beginning. It's always been about God. It's always been about his fame. It's always been about his glory. So since it's always been about him, you don't have to carry it all on your shoulders. Your kids will be taken care of. Your finances will be taken care of. Your heart will be taken care of. Your business will be taken care of. Your city will be taken care of. Your whole life is in the palm of his hands, and he has the ability to lead you and guide you into all truth. They're thinking maybe the devil's stopping us, but it wasn't the devil. It was the spirit of Jesus saying, no, I don't want you going that direction. Then a dream happens. He has a dream. It's a man of Macedonia. And the man of Macedonia says, please come and help. I want you to see the urgency. They get up immediately, and all of a sudden, they're now going to jump into their Tesla, and they're going to make their way from the direction they were trying to go to another direction. No Tesla at all. They're actually about to jump on a ship sail some 156 miles. You're going to find out in just a second the wind seems to be right behind their back because they sail these 156 miles in just two short days. Here we are in, in uh, chapter 16, verse number 11 from Choraz. We put out to sea and sailed straight for Samotris. I think I'm saying that right. And the next day we went on to Nepolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony, the leading city of that district of Macedonia. And we stayed there several days. For those of you who are history buffs, just a quick little note here about Philippi. Uh, uh, Mark Anthony and Octavian, they actually defeated Brutus and Cassius here in this city a number of years ago. It was with the Second Roman Civil War. So these are real places we're talking about here. These aren't like mythological places. These are real places you can go and visit even today. So here uh, on the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river. Where we, we, where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman from the city of Thyatira named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth. She was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. I, I, I like this. Understand, there is... There's not really a thriving church. The reason we, we know that, and not even a lot of Jews at this point in time, uh, because there's not even a synagogue in the city. So... Uh, Paul and his companions, and you can notice the word we is shared a bunch in here. This is the gospel writer Luke has now jumped on the journey. Uh, Luke is the one that's responsible. Really, he wrote the, the, major, the most amount of print in the New Testament comes from Luke. 
Acts and Luke. He wrote, wrote both of these books. Though the Apostle Paul, obviously his theology has, has shaped uh, the, the, the New Testament and the gospel of grace and all of that. The, the, the writer Luke, this doctor, he has so many words in print and he has jumped on the journey here with Paul and his companions. And, and he's saying, now we, 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 we got there to Philippi and we went to the leading city. Why would they go to the leading city? Why would they go to that particular place? They were trying to find a place of influence. What Paul's mindset was, it seems in Scripture, is that he was willing to go to a place of influence, and he understood if I can impact the gospel there, if I can impact people's lives with the gospel in this place of influence, then what will happen is there will be a ripple effect, and it will go to the surrounding communities. Can I just tell you for a second, you're in one of those cities of influence? Can I tell you that's what Atlanta is? And I know we've got friends online right now, too. So wherever your city is, it matters to God, too. Even if some random city like Lubbock. But even, no matter where you may be, understand that God put Passion City here in the city of Atlanta. Because I dare say if Passion City catches a cold, then the world will catch a cold. That if God can do something in a city like Atlanta, then don't you know that this is a hub for Delta? It can go all around the world. Don't you know that if God can do something here, he can influence the surrounding community? You, God did not bring you here just to exist. He didn't put your family here just to take up space. He put you here because he knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, if I can impact an influential city, then I can impact a nation. And dare I say, if God can impact a nation, what might he be able to do in the world? I want you to begin to see that your life is not an accident. It is strategic. God has been lining things up from the very beginning. And if you're brand new to this church, you need to know that God has been orchestrating things, closing other doors and opening other doors to bring you to this place right here. Stop sitting on the sidelines. It is time for you to jump all the way in because the mission and the call of the gospel is not just to stay in these four walls, but to reach every single man and woman on the whole face of the earth. A leading city, a leading city, a leading city. So those of you who are influential in the business world, understand you're in the Bible too. Because most people in the Bible aren't pastors. You know that, right? Most of them are marketplace people. Like, I know, I, and I, I, I'm, I'm a pastor, so I'm not there trying to demean or, or disregard the call. It's an important one but it's not the only one. So here is this woman, Lydia, a dealer in purple. And now for us, we're like, what does that mean? Well, just so you know, it's expensive. This, this, this woman, she, she's, she's making it rain. <laughs> this woman right here, you know, she's got her stuff together. She's out there. And when Paul is, goes to this influential city, he ends up in an area with an influential woman, a woman that has strength and power. I just want to celebrate just for a quick second. I'm so thankful for women with strength and power. I'm so thankful for even like a Shelly Giglio and all the team that is here. I'm thankful that God in the Bible is like, hey, I'm not trying to tell you that I'm not going to put gifts and talents on the inside of women. Matter of fact, I'm going to put them in men and I'm going to put them on women. You talking about Pentecost, I'm pouring out my spirit on men and on women, on my sons and my daughters. I am going to do what I want to do in and through every single person that I put on this planet. So here in this moment, the Apostle Paul is hanging out with Lydia. She's a dealer in purple and she and her whole household get saved. So he's influencing the business community. Then, then something happens next that's interesting. They're hanging around in the city, and, uh, and we're not going to read this part of the text. You, you can read it later. But they're in the city, and this, uh, this fortune teller, this young lady who's a fortune teller, she's actually a slave to some other business owners. I even hate to call them that, but that's what 
they were, even though their business was shady and they had enslaved this little girl, she has an ability to like tell people their fortunes. And she's following around Paul and Luke and the others, and she's shouting, hey, listen to those guys. They're telling you the way. Follow what they're saying. So here is a young lady who is influenced by demonic, dark demons, but she's saying the right thing. So I just say, be careful. Just because someone is saying the right thing does not mean they're saying it with the right spirit. So just because he says he goes to church (laughs) does not mean (laughs) you ought to give him your whole heart and your life. You might need to swipe right one more time. (laughs) Maybe swipe, maybe, maybe put down the swiping, okay? Maybe just put, let's get serving, stop swiping, and then let's see what God will do with bringing you the right man or woman into your life. <laughs> just because she says this is what she thinks, just because he says, it doesn't always mean they're saying it with the right spirit. So for a couple of days, this young lady and her handlers are following the apostle Paul around. And she's shouting, she's shouting, she's shouting, she's shouting. And then one day, you can read it later, Paul's like, I'm done with this. I I, I can't have this anymore. He turns around and rebukes the demon that's on the inside of her. Okay, this is crazy, y'all. This is crazy. He says, in the name of Jesus, come on out. Now, I know for some of us, we're like, I'm very uncomfortable right now, okay? I guess maybe you ought to be because I've tried to do this with my kids when I thought something was going on with them. (laughs) This can, (laughs) honey, this cannot be, this cannot be normal. In the name of Jesus. No, he's just two. He's just two. That's, (laughs) but parents, you've wondered, come on, you've wondered. (laughs) So I, I'm not a person that's like, you know, there's a demon under every rock, and all, you know, there's a spirit of caffeine. You know, people do kind of crazy stuff out there. No, you just need coffee. So you, but in this moment, the Apostle Paul knows it's not right. It's not right. You know when you know, you just know it's not right. Something's off here. Business owner, you can walk in, you can go, huh, something, something's not right. I can, I can feel something is off here. I, I know Louie and, and Shelly have felt this at times. Something's, whoa, 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 what, what's going on? What's going on with the staff? Something. Come on. Something's not right. You felt this with your roommate. You felt it with your best friend. You walked in, you go, whoa. Hey, I know you something's off here. So the apostle Paul and, the, and, and his, his companions are feeling like some, something's off. Here's a powerful thing about something being off. When, when something's not in alignment, now obviously here it's a demon. Other times it just might be an attitude. It might just be a mindset. Here's a beautiful thing. I like the authority that they are walking in that comes from being a follower of Jesus. And this is something I feel like sometimes we have stepped away from as followers of Jesus Christ. And I want us to step more into that you are not just here existing. You are not just here taking up space. You have been put as an ambassador of heaven to be a representative representative of the kingdom of God in your generation. So that means when you pray, you don't have to pray just weak, little anemic prayers. You are, your prayers are not based on your faith. Your prayers are based on the power and the might of almighty God. So when I walk into a room, I'm walking into this room, not with my head down, but with my head up, not because I'm prideful, but because I'm surrendered because I've been put here on assignment. So I want to shake you from the inside out and say, son and daughter, 
of Almighty God, you have been given an authority in this generation to speak the name of Jesus and to declare his power and his goodness and his might and his love and his mercy and this gospel of grace. So I want you to do it with all the fire that you possibly can muster because heaven has your back. Heaven has your back. Heaven has your back. Heaven has your back. If your house is not the way you want it to be right now, heaven has your back. Take the authority in your home. Go ahead and walk through the walls of your house, praying over your home, asking for the kingdom of God to fill that house. If your mind is not right, I want you walking with the authority that comes from heaven. You are not just some random bystander. You are a son and a daughter of Almighty God put on this earth for such a time as this. And if you think just the power hitters are just Louis Giglio, then you're missing it because the Spirit was put on the inside of all of us. The Holy Spirit has empowered each and every one of us to be his hands and his feet in our generation. So here, this woman gets freed from this evil spirit. Now, these guys are about to lose some money, and they're upset about it. I mean, people are kind of okay with you talking about Jesus and still start impacting their pocketbook. They're like, oh, no, 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 no. And now watch this, watch this, watch this. Oh, I think I'm in verse number, ooh, let's go verse number 19. When her owners, Acts chapter 16, verse number 19, when her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace. This is not figuratively speaking. They dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept a practice. The crowd, watch this, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods after they had been severely flogged. They were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fasten their feet in the stocks. What? Paul and Silas didn't even ask to go to Philippi. The only reason they ended up there is because God gave them a dream. The only reason they ended up there is because there was a vision of a man from Macedonia. Remember, they were trying to go someplace else and the spirit of Jesus kept stopping them from going that other place. So now they go where God sends them and in the place God sends them, this is what they get. I know maybe you're wondering if you're in the right place and in the right season because bad things are happening. Because you're navigating difficulty. But what we see here in the text is that God stopped them from going where they wanted to go. Led them to the place he wanted them to be. And where he wanted them to be, there was persecution. beaten. Ever felt this? Ever felt like, God, I did not ask for this. I didn't ask to be here. God, I'm, I would have been fine being single. <laughs> but now I'm walking through this in my marriage? God, I would have been fine not having any kids. But now you have me in the hospital with a child? God, I would have been fine 
fill in the blank. But you led me here and where you led me, I'm bleeding, I'm beaten in the place that you led me? If you've never been here, just keep following Jesus a little bit longer. Okay? This is not the fine print at the bottom of the contract. This is right there at the top. <laughs> Saying when you are a follower of Christ, you and I don't get to be immune to the problems and the difficulties and the pains and the persecutions of this life. Y'all, they're just preaching the gospel. They're just trying to help people. That's all they're trying to do. You ever feel like, God, all, all I'm trying to do is just, I'm just trying to do good. And this is what I'm going to get. We are, you know, Pastor Louis mentioned it, uh, uh, we're in the middle of, you know, we actually have two buildings that we are, um, we just purchased and we're renovating right now, which I don't know if it was the right thing, but I felt like we talked to the board and everybody was like, yeah, let's do it. So woo, it's been, uh, it's been a ma massive step of faith for sure. <laughs> like, okay, Lord, let's go ahead and do this. Uh, so as we have taken these steps, uh, we have heard from so many friends of ours that whenever you go and you take ground and you want to get any building, that there's a lot of opposition that can come at you. And my wife and I were sitting and we were talking and contemplating, uh, should we take this step of faith? Because I don't know if we want the smoke that's going to come with this, right? So we were sitting there and we're praying through it. And Onika's like, I don't know. And uh, I, I said, honey, there is no guarantee that if we play it safe, the enemy's not going to attack us. So let's just go ahead and do everything that God is calling us to do because we know that it's better to be in his will than it is to play safe. And I'm just praying because that's the spirit and the heart that is on this house. This is a house that takes ground. This is a house that believes God for miracles. This is a house that trusts God to do the impossible. This church family is a church family that says we're going to take out a whole week and serve a whole community. This is a church family that will say let's go ahead and take over an entire arena and make it a sanctuary for the kingdom of God. We are a people that believe God for miracles. That's who you are. But even even in the midst of it, please understand there are some battle scars and some wounds that some have experienced that they can't even talk about. There are some things that even Louis has gone through that he hasn't shared with anybody else. And as part of, I'm taking ground, but dang, I've been hit. I'm moving forward, but man, I'm faced with some opposition. And here they are, beaten, dragged, humiliated, mocked, talked about. And they find themselves, they find themselves in the inner cell. Verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. I, I told you them being dragged and beaten was not metaphorical. <laughs> it was literal. So understand, them being flogged and beaten, especially by Romans, there was no limit to the number of hits they would take. If this were Jewish people beating them, there would be a limit, but there was no limit. They are beaten to a pulp. I don't mean to be too dramatic, but I just know for a lot of us, and maybe not all of us, but for a lot of us, we have felt this even internally. And maybe it has not been a physical beating, 
but it's been an emotional one. It's been a mental one. The anxiety is real. The pressure of the finances are real. What's going on with our families is real. What's going on with our, in our relationships is real. So they, they're being beaten, beaten, beaten. Then after they're beaten, the jailer takes them and throws them in the maximum security portion of the prison. Their feet are tied in these stocks, probably separated, that will increase the cramping and the discomfort that they're experiencing. The, the, the blood is dried on their face. Their eyes are swollen. Their backs are bruised. Maybe they're concussed. And they are here in the inner prison doing what God has asked them to do. Then, about midnight, with the pain, with the tears, with the hurt, with the difficulty, with the betrayal, with the confusion, with the angst, with the pressure, with the dried blood on their face, they start praying and praising. Now in this moment, there is no music. There's, there's, no, there's no music. And while they have all that pressure on them, you hear from the inner jail cell. You are worthy of it all. Whew. You're worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the Glory. It's while they're hurting. And they start singing. And they're praying. They're praying in the midst of the pain. God, I trust you. I gotta trust you. Advance your kingdom, advance your fame, advance your name in the earth. God, I trust you. They're praying and they're singing. And it says the other prisoners start listening. And when the other prisoners start listening, look at this. Look, this is what the text says, right? It says, about midnight, again, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, verse 26, suddenly there was such a violent earthquake. There was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prisoners, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had a Escape. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. Wait, you're telling me that them praying and praising in the midst of their pain and persecution somehow made its way through that maximum security jail cell. It made its way through their bloodstained shirt and faces. It made its way through their puffy lips and their swollen eyes and somehow reached the very throne of heaven. And when God began to hear their praises and there was no music, there were no lights, all he heard was them praying and their praising. Then God said, I'm going to move in this situation. And God shakes the very prison where they found themselves bound. What's your way to get out of where you are it's not complaining friends it's not bickering 
it's not pointing fingers. For every one of us at all of our locations, for us, it is us saying, God, in the midst of the prison that I find myself in, I am going to praise and I'm going to pray. And as we begin to praise and as we begin to pray, God does something unique in the story. He does not just free Paul and Silas. He frees everyone that was hearing them praising and praying. So I dare to tell you that the people who are around you that are watching you walk through the death, that are watching you walk through the difficulty, that are watching you walk through the betrayal, that are watching you walk through the heaviness as they see you pray and praise in the midst of everything that you're walking through. Please understand that you're going to help some chains fall off of their hearts as well so they too can begin to praise and declare the goodness and the grace of Almighty God. But some people see it and they misinterpret it. So the jailer misinterprets what happens and he's about to kill himself. I don't mean to get too heavy here. I don't want to get too heavy at all. But if you've ever been at this place, or even if you're at this place right now where you're thinking, it's just over for me, I'm done. Can I just say to you, don't kill yourself? We're all here. Can I just tell you that there are people on your right and your left? We're all here. Can I just tell you to put down the sword, put down the bottle, put down the pills, put down the beating yourself up? We're all here. All you got to do is let us know. All you got to do is raise your hand. All you got to do is announce that I need some help. We're all here. You're not navigating life alone. You're not on some island all by yourself. You are not some aberration that we don't understand what's going on in your world. No if you'll speak up I want you to know we're all here we have your back put down the sword we love you don't do it we're all here so the jailer stops and then look at this then the jailer called for lights rushed in and fell, trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Verse 31, they replied, look at this. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. This is not complicated. It is not hard. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. I don't want to make this too hard for you. I don't want to make it a song and a dance because what Jesus Christ did for you on that old rugged cross and him getting out of that grave was enough to save you and your entire household. And all you need to do is believe in the Lord Jesus. Jesus and you will be saved. Wait, wait, wait. I don't have to be perfect. I don't have to have it all together. No, it's by grace through faith in Jesus that you are made right with God. So church family, every location, understand what do we need here? We need a faith that is dependent upon our glorious Savior, for Him to do the work in our hearts, for Him to do the work in our lives. And as He does it, salvation and new life come. 